everyone. Welcome to Stats Rescue 911. My name is Lynn, and in this video lesson, we are going to learn about linear correlation. This is just an introduction, some of the basics that you uh, are going to learn about here, and I encourage you to watch some of my other videos on more advanced topics in linear correlation after this one. All right, so. Uh, before we get going, there are a few things that you really ought to know a bit about before we proceed with the uh, tutorial. Um, you should know something about the scales of measurement, also called the levels of measurement. In, particularly, you should, in particular, you should know what is meant by an interval and a ratio scale of measurement. Also helpful for this uh, lesson is for you to know something about scatter plots. All right, so assuming that you do know something about these topics, let's proceed. And we'll start with a very basic definition of what correlation means. So first of all, correlation is a statistical technique that tells you if scores on variable X are related in any way to scores on variable Y. So in other words, does X tell you anything about Y? All right. If they if there is a relationship, then knowing something about X will tell you something about Y. So let's look at a few examples. This is a very, very common, it's almost like a mandatory example that you have to have in any statistics textbook. And that is uh, the example where we want to find the correlation between height and weight. There is absolutely a relationship there. Whether or not there is a linear correlation uh, remains to be seen, but certainly uh, overall, especially the younger ages, as someone increases in height, they also increase in weight. All right, Or you could say it the other way around, as weight increases, height increases. And again, this is especially true if you look at uh, children from birth until the time they stop growing in height which is around uh, the age of 18, depending, of course, on the individual. As another example here, um, there is a relationship between how much you exercise and how much you weigh. So in general, the more, ex the more you exercise, the more calories you burn and the less you weigh. Or we could say it the other way around. We could say that, uh, in general, lighter people tend to exercise more. All right? But there are some variables where we cannot measure, at least using linear correlation, we cannot measure the relationship between uh, certain variables. So, for example, if we wanted to look at the relationship between GPA and academic major at a university, we would we certainly could look at that relationship, but we couldn't look at it using uh, the linear correlation technique. Um, and that's because in this particular example, uh, university major, whether you're a biology major or a math major, physics major, psychology major, that is not an interval or ratio variable. All right, that would be best described as a nominal variable. And uh, GPA, well, it depends how you measure GPA. If you measure GPA just with a letter like A, B, C, D, etc., then um, this would be uh, best described as a ordinal variable. And again, in order for you to use linear regression, you have linear regression. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. In order for you to calculate a linear correlation, remember that both of your variables must be interval or ratio. So in this particular example, uh, once again, the university major down here, that would be best described as nominal. And GPA, if we were to use letter grades like A, B, C, D, etc., that would be best described as uh, ordinal. So uh, this would not be uh, capable of being measured. The relationship between the two would not be capable of being measured or assessed through a linear correlation. Now, it is true that we could take GPA and express it as a number. 
4.0, 3.5, 3.0, etc. And if we did that, then yes, it would fall on an interval or ratio scale, but we would still have a problem because this variable over here is not inter, um, interval or ratio. Okay, so again, just to kind of recap here, um, we could look at the relationship between height and weight because these can both be expressed as an interval or ratio scale. We can look at the relationship between exercise and weight because both of these can also be expressed as interval or ratio variables. But this one down here, this one is not possible because even though we could find a way of expressing GPA as interval or ratio, uh, university major is not capable of being expressed uh, that way. All right. When you run a correlation, and by the way, I don't think I mentioned this before, but when we do a linear correlation, what we are actually using is Pearson correlation, right? It's called Pearson correlation or Pearson product moment correlation. Um, this is what we are using when we calculate a linear correlation between two or more variables. In the previous slide, you saw examples of uh, calculating a correlation between just two variables at a time. That is called simple correlation. But you can also run a correlation between three variables, four variables, five variables, etc. And that's called multiple correlation. All right, so in this discussion, though, since it's only an introduction to correlation, we're going to stick to the two variable or simple correlation examples. All right. All right. So in this slide, you can see that when we run a correlation, uh, we actually end up calculating what is called the correlation coefficient which is expressed as an R value. So you're going to see R equals and then some number. All right. And again, R is the correlation coefficient. And R can take on any number between negative 1 and positive 1. If you get an R of positive 1 or negative 1, it means that the correlation between the two variables is perfect. All right. So that means if we know somebody's score on X, we know their score on Y and we will always know their score on Y. There will never be any um, variation there. So, for example, if there was a perfect relationship between height and weight, it means that if, for example, somebody five feet weighs 120 pounds, that will always be true. So if there would be no variation. So uh, if you had 100 people and all 100 people were 5 feet tall, all 100 people would weigh 120 pounds. All right. So that's what it means to be perfect. All right. When you know X, you know Y, and there's never any variation in Y. Okay. Uh, that is for that given X. All right, so uh, if it's positive 1, it means the relationship between x and y is perfect. If it's negative 1, it also means perfect. We're going to talk about the difference between positive and negative 1 in a minute. I want to point out here, though, that if you get an r value equal to 0, it means there is no linear correlation between your two variables. All right, so I like to... Uh, tell people, remember that zero means null, not a nothing. All right, there is no relationship there, no linear relationship. Now, as our R value gets closer and closer to positive one, it means that the relationship between your two variables is getting stronger and stronger. Same thing over here, however. As the R value gets closer and closer to negative 1, it means that the relationship between X and Y is getting stronger and stronger. And you're going to see examples of this. All right, so as a very, very rough guideline, if you were to see an R value between uh, 0.1 and 0.3, now this could be positive or negative, it doesn't matter, but anything between 0.1 and 0.3, that is described as a weak relationship. 
anything between 0.4 and 0.6 is moderate, and between 0.7 and 0.9 is strong. Now, just as a FYI here, uh, I would never recommend that you describe a correlation of plus one or negative one as strong. Plus one and negative one is in fact perfect, which goes beyond strong, all right? Now, remember that when uh, I've given you these ranges, this is only a very rough guideline, all right? And remember that this range can be either positive values or negative values, all right? Whether a correlation is negative or positive does not say anything about the strength of the relationship. All right, so if you were to get an R value of 0.9, positive 0.9, or an R value of negative 0.9, both of those R values would reflect an equally strong relationship. I also want to point out that what is considered strong, moderate, or weak actually depends on the field or topic of investigation. So uh, in physics or chemistry, a relationship that is 0.4 to 0.6, for them, that might be considered pretty weak. In psychology, however, if we get a correlation between 0.4 and 0.6, well, for us, that is actually considered very strong. All right, so it just depends on the field of investigation. All right. Let's now talk about what the sign the R value tells you. All right, so the number itself, whether it's 0 0.1 to 0 0.3, 0 0.4 to 0.6, the actual number tells you how weak, moderate, or strong the relationship is, but the sign, positive or negative, tells you the direction of the relationship. So for example, if you get a negative R value, that means that uh, as scores increase, in one variable, they decrease in the other variable. In other words, your scores are moving in opposite directions. So you could say as x increases, y decreases. But you could also reverse that and say as y increases, x decreases. It really doesn't matter. We'll look at some examples here. What is a positive correlation? Positive correlation means that X and Y are moving in the same direction. So as X increases, Y increases. But it's important to note that this could go the opposite way, right? You could say as X decreases, Y decreases. What's key here is that they are both moving in the same direction, all right? So can you think of examples of negative relationships, negative correlations, and examples of positive correlations? Uh, for example, a, a very good positive correlation might be as grades, um, sorry, as you spend more time studying, your grades on a test increase. I think all teachers believe that. I don't know if all students believe that, but it's true that as you study more, you can expect to get a higher grade. When would we see a negative correlation? Well, how about this? As the temperature outside drops, the more we shiver. We'd have to quantify uh, how we're going to measure shivering, but certainly, as you know, as the temperature drops, you begin to shake more and more and more, and that would be an example of a negative correlation. Now, it's often helpful to visualize what correlations look like by examining a scatter plot. So here I have shown you scatter plots to represent what a, a perfect positive correlation would look like all the way through to a perfect negative correlation. All right. So in essence, when you're looking at a scatter plot, what you want to do is see how well the dots on the scatter plot, uh, how long they fit a straight line. And of course, the dots on your scatter plot actually uh, represent a value for x and a value for y. So for each of these scatter plots, we have x, the values of x uh, on the x-axis here. 
all right, the horizontal axis, and values of y along the vertical axis. So each plot, each dot on the scatter plot, is a certain value of x for a certain value of y. It's a pair, all right? All right, so if we start, let's look at this one here. And we can see that if we were to draw a straight line uh, that uh, through this data set, that all the, uh, the dots would fall on this straight line. When that occurs, we know that the relationship between our two variables is perfect. When all the dots on the scatter plot fall on that straight line, okay, perfect correlation. In this particular example, we are looking at a positive correlation, and that is shown by the fact that as we increase values of x, what's happening to y? Well, y is increasing, right? So as x increases, so does y. All right, we can also uh, say that the correlation is positive because the slope of the line is positive. All right, so you might remember back from earlier days in your schooling, you learned that a positive slope occurs when it starts in the lower left and it increases to the upper right. That's a positive slope, okay? So this tells us that R is positive as X increases, Y increases, and we know it's perfect because all the dots fall on the line. Now in this example, it's still a positive correlation. We see that the slope of the line is positive. We can also see that as values of x increase, values of y increase. So they're moving in the same direction. All right. But this time you'll notice that there um, is some scatter around the straight line. If we were to draw a straight line through this data set, some of the dots would be on the line, but clearly there would be dots that are off the line. As soon as we begin to see some scatter away from the line, that's telling us that the relationship is no longer perfect. And the more scatter we see around the line, the weaker the relationship is. So here, I would say that even though there is some scatter around the line, um, it's, not, it's not excessive. Most of the lines are, sorry, most of the dots are pretty close to the line. So we would find that this is a relatively high positive correlation. We might expect to see an R value here of 0.8 or higher even. But if we go to the next one, we can still see a linear trend in the data set, right? If we look at these dots, we can see that they move from the lower uh, left to the upper right. So we have a positive slope, a positive correlation. As X increases, Y is also increasing. But notice how there's a lot more scatter now. Uh, these dots are further away on average to the line. And so what that's telling us is that although there is still a relationship between X and Y, the relationship is becoming weaker. All right. Now, so far, I've been describing this as saying as X increases, Y increases. But remember that you can say both X and Y are increasing or back both x and y are decreasing. So if I wanted to, I could start here, for example. And if I started in this part of the graph, I could say, well, as x goes down, y also goes down. Remember, the key to a positive correlation is that, to understanding that, is that both x and y have to be increasing together or decreasing together. All right, now let's look at what a negative correlation would look like. And let's start again here with the perfect negative correlation. So now, once again, you see that all the dots fall on a straight line, so that makes it perfect. If you know x, you know y. Uh, and the fact that the slope of the line is negative tells us that this is going to be a negative r value, a negative correlation coefficient. So here, I keep losing my cursor, but here we see that as x increases, y is now decreasing. So they're moving in opposite directions. x is going up, y is going down. All right. If we look at the next example, um, whoops, I went the wrong way. Sorry. Here we go. Next example is showing you a high negative correlation. 
So again, we see that the slope of the line is negative. It starts in the upper left and goes to the lower right. All right, this is a negative slope. We can also see that as x is increasing, y is decreasing. But notice now how the dots have started to move away from the line, all right, the hypothetical line here. If we were to draw a straight line, most of the dots, even though they've moved away from the line, they're still pretty close, right? I mean, there's not a lot of scatter. So what we would conclude here is that we have a, a strong correlation, even though it's not perfect, it's still very strong. And I'm betting if you were to calculate the R value here, it would be negative 0.8 maybe negative 0.85, but certainly it would be a strong negative correlation. If we look at, oh, I keep going the wrong way here, folks. Sorry about that. Look over here at this next one. This would be a low negative correlation. We can definitely see a pattern here. We can see that the dots are moving in this direction, uh, but the scatter around the line is much greater. And so that weakens or it suggests that the, the relationship between X and Y is much weaker here. And then finally, and I promise I'm going to go in the right direction, here is an example of no correlation. We say there's no correlation because if you were to look at this graph, could you really tell me which way we should be drawing the line? All right, should we draw it this way? Should we draw it this way? We really can't see any reliable pattern between X and Y. It just seems to be all helter-skelter. And you will learn later that when you have a relationship like this, in other words, when there is no correlation, no relationship, the best way to draw a straight line would be through the middle of your data set and horizontal, all right? And we'll explain exactly where that line is drawn at another time, all right? But that's where we would draw this line, all right? So no correlation means that you really cannot draw a straight line through the data set that shows either a positive slope or a negative slope, um, could go either way, that would represent no linear correlation. All right? Now, it is critically important when you calculate a, a correlation coefficient, when you calculate an R value, if it's Pearson, Pearson product moment, okay, that, that linear correlation, you also have to construct a scatter plot because sometimes there are relationships between X and Y, but they're just not linear. And so you can be misled. You can calculate R value, the R value for Pearson, and it could come out pretty low. And you might be thinking, oh, so there's really nothing there. In reality, maybe there is something there. It's just not linear. So if we look at this uh, example over here, all right, we see that there is actually a very strong relationship between X and Y. But clearly, it's not linear. In fact, if we were to try and use Pearson's R value to describe this relationship, well, Pearson requires that we look at a linear relationship. So it's going to want to draw a line. It's going to want to draw a line here. And if it did draw a line there, well, if that was our entire data set, we would say, oh, well, we've got a pretty good relationship here, a pretty good linear relationship. But remember that we also have these data uh, points. And so if we tried to draw a line here, we would get almost the opposite, right? We would get a pretty decent relationship um, linear relationship on this side. But remember that Pearson can only draw one line. It can't draw one line here and one line there. It has to draw one single line. And so what's going to happen is in order to try and fit the data, it's going to draw a line that is pretty much horizontal. And so what you're going to see is a very, very low R value. Remember that when there is no relationship, no linear relationship between X and Y, R is going to be somewhere around zero, and you will get that horizontal line, a line without a slope. And so uh, with this curvy linear data, uh, again, Pearson is going to want to draw that straight line because it, it gets confused, right? And you're going to be tricked into thinking there's no relationship when in fact there is one, it's just not linear.
Same thing over here, all right? There is a very good relationship here between x and y, but it's just not linear. So if we could draw two lines, we would want to draw one line here, and that would be a pretty strong relationship between x and y. And then we'd want to draw a second line here, and that would also be pretty good, a pretty good relationship between x and y. But because Pearson can only draw one line, it's going to draw a line with uh, very little slope. It might be a bit of a positive slope here, but we're going to get more or less a flat line. And in other words, our R value is going to come out very low. And without looking at this, we're going to think there's nothing there when in fact there is. So the moral of the story, if you're going to calculate an R value, a correlation coefficient for Pearson or any R value really, always plot your data. Your data can be telling you a story that's different from what your R value would suggest. Okay. Now it's time, on, time to move on to something called R squared, uh, which is referred to as the coefficient of determination. Now be careful because it's easily confused with the correlation coefficient. Correlation coefficient is R, correlation, uh, sorry, coefficient of determination is R squared. R squared tells you how much of the variability in your Y values is explained or accounted for by X. Now I am going to explain that, so don't worry, but just think about this. R, your correlation tells you, uh, coefficient, R tells you how strong the relationship is between X and Y and the direction of the relationship. R squared tells you nothing about the direction of the relationship because all R squared values are going to be positive, right? If you take any number and square it, it's going to be positive. So R squared tells you nothing about the direction of the relationship. It does tell you, however, how well, that is how much, of the um, variability in y is explained by x. So through that, we can get a sense of how strong the relationship is, because the stronger the relationship is between x and y, the more of the variability in y in the y scores will be explained by x. Now, still that may be a little foggy, all right? So let's look at some examples. What if, for example, we wanted to know uh, what explains somebody's weight, all right? So uh, clearly we have variability in weight. Some people are very, very thin. Some people are impossibly thin and out of proportion like Barbie here. Uh, but some people weigh very, very little. Other people are, you know, maybe just right around, um, you know, a healthy weight. Some people are a little overweight. Some people are very, very heavy. All right. There's variability in weight. So let's, let's assume that weight, all right, is variable y. Okay. So y just represents different uh, values of weight. So what, what might account for variable, variability in weight? Well, certainly how many calories you get each day could explain at least part of how much you weigh, all right? So somebody who consumes 500 calories a day, we shouldn't, if they're, they're an adult, well, they should be getting more than that. But if they did only get 500 calories a day, we would expect them to be very, very thin, right? We wouldn't expect them to be, weigh very much. But if somebody is consuming 4,000, 5,000 calories a day, well, we would expect that those people would weigh a lot. So certainly the number of calories you consume each day are going to factor in, help to explain how much you weigh. But it's more than just that. How much exercise you get would certainly explain to a certain extent uh, how much you weigh. Would it explain 100% of the variability in people's weights? No, because we've already said that calories would be a part of the equation as well. So how much you weigh is likely explained by calorie uh, consumption each day and exercise activity each day. And there's likely a whole bunch of other factors. 
For example, even sleeping. All right, researchers are connecting the dots here. They're seeing a relationship between uh, sleep, the number of hours you sleep in a 24-hour period, and um, quality of sleep can affect your weight as well. All right. So clearly then there are many variables, only a few of which were touched on here, but many variables can help to explain or account for somebody's weight. But we are going to, in this um, video uh, lecture, we're just going to look at simple correlation, right? So we're only looking at two variables at a time, x and y. So let's just look at one of these three variables, okay? So sleep, calories, exercise, we're just going to look at one of them, and we're going to say how much of the variability in y, in other words, the weight scores, is explained by x, all right? And in this case, we are going to try and explain weight by looking at calories, all right? So we want to know how much of the variability in somebody's weight is explained by daily caloric intake. So we're going to focus on calories. So what you would do is you would proceed by calculating the correlation between weight and calories. So you would get a sample of people and uh, ideally you would want it to be as large as, as feasible, as reasonable, but you get a sample of people and you measure their weight and you also measure um, you know, how much they consume in calories on a daily basis. And let's say that you calculated the correlation to be 0 0.50. All right, so that's pretty decent, right? That would put us, uh, I would say, at least in the moderate category. Again, it depends on the field of investigation. But in this case, 0.50 would be moderate. But in order to figure out the percentage of the variability in Y, that's weight, um, explained by calories, you have to square the R value. So R squared, if you take 0.5 times 0.5, you get 0.25. Now, that is R squared. We often, though, express R squared as a percentage. So we probably want to um, multiply this by 100. And if we do, then we can say that 25% of the variability in people's weights is explained or accounted for by how many calories they consume daily. All right, so that's pretty good. We're saying, well, we can explain 25% of people's weights just by looking at calorie intake. But then that leaves us with 75% of the variability unexplained, right? Because if 25% is explained and, you know, we have to get to 100%, if, 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 if ever a variable explained 100%, then there would be no other variables involved. But we've already said, look, there's other variables involved when trying to explain weight. Calorie intake is only one of them. We've just determined, okay, well, if, if these numbers are correct, then 25% of the weight is explained. That means 75% is unexplained. All right. So what accounts for the extra 75%? We can call that error, unexplained or error. Well, that's that is a question for more research. We would want to look at activity levels. We would want to look at sleep time. We might want to look at some genetic variables. Um, we might want to look at um, different levels of hormones that are thought to control uh, people's weights and whether they uh, you know, uh, have a lot of triggers to increase uh, eating or decrease eating, etc. Lots and lots of variables that we could do research on. But in this particular hypothetical study, we only looked at calories and calories explained 25%. Everything else, we're just going to chalk up to the 75% and call it error. All right, unexplained or error. Well, that's it. Um, I hope that this uh, introductory video was helpful. And please watch some of my other videos on correlation to learn even more about this fascinating statistic. All right. Thanks for watching. Hit that like button. Bye.